Hello, my name is John Brink and we are podcasting from Prince George on the Brink. And today we have a very interesting guest and his name is Joel McKay, who is the Chief Executive Officer's Northern Development Initiative Trust. A long name, I have to kind of look at it. <laughs> yeah, it is you a know, long so, name, yeah. uh, But uh, tell us uh, first a little bit about yourself. You know, uh, you, are you from the area or where are you from and how did you get here? Oh, well, that's a story in and of itself. Well, first, thanks for having me, John. It's yeah. awesome to just be able to sit down and, and, yeah, and have sure. a conversation with you. Um, my story. So I was born in North Van uh, and then kind of raised through elementary school in South Burnaby, just south of Metrotown. And then high school in Coquitlam and a failed first year or two of college in Coquitlam, New West. And then uh, uh, Port Coquitlam and spent some time there. And then uh, before I moved up here uh, in 2012, I was uh, downtown Vancouver for a couple of years working in the media there. So I like to tell people um, I'm one of those rare people in British Columbia. I'm actually uh, a third generation Vancouverite. You don't meet many people no. who, uh, who've been there as long. Um, of course, when I say that to indigenous people, they laugh me out of the room. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of pride uh, in my family being in British Columbia for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and then moved up here uh, 10 years ago for lifestyle, really, and uh, yeah. got a career change along with it. But uh, yeah, I've, I've lived or worked in every municipality in the lower mainland at one point or another. And with this job and my time in Northern BC, um, I can say I've been to just about every town in British Columbia. There's only now, a few I haven't been to. Now, is there a connection? I, I just kind of looked at some of your background. Is there a connection to the Robson Valley? Yeah, yeah. So um, my great uh, grandfather, uh, he was living in Minnesota uh, right around just prior to the First World War. Okay. And um, he saw an advertisement for essentially free land in a place called the Robson Valley. Yeah. And uh, they wanted to get out of the prairies. Uh, yeah. So him and my great grandmother uh, decided uh, to move up here. He came first uh, and uh, he came into Dunster and got some land, which at the time was the worst land in the valley. It was the land that is now closest to the highway. Okay. Um, but at that point in time was on the opposite side of the valley from in where the, the middle railway. of nowhere. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere and from where the railway was. Yeah. And he homesteaded there and then my great grandmother showed up five or six months later um, and they built a home there and stayed there until the mid to late seventies, I think they were there for. But my my grandmother was born there, uh, as well as her sister and, and brother, um, and the family name at that time was Blackwood. And um, the hill about five or six years ago was renamed uh, Blackwood, where the family farm still is. Wow. Uh, it's not owned by our family, hasn't been since the 70s, no. but uh, the family farm is still there. It's still the Blackwood Hill. And, and uh, when I moved here, one of the first things I did, um, because I'd grown up listening to my grandmother's stories about Dunster, I'd never yeah. been, yeah. was I went down to the Dunster Ice Cream Social by myself. I well, didn't exactly. know anybody just to see what this place was and yeah. fell in love with the valley. And uh, uh, it was kind of neat because I'd never been, even though I'm from the Lower Mainland, I'd never been to a place where I felt I had a real family connection yeah, yeah. with any length attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about those roots. And interestingly yeah. enough, the other thing is, um, I was fortunate I moved up here, I met my wife, we have two daughters. Um, my eldest daughter was the first girl of the Blackwood line to have been born in Northern British Columbia since my grandmother in 1930 in Dunster. Wow. Yeah, and my grandmother actually has a Prince George connection. She, um, after I moved up here, she came to visit. She's still alive. She lives in, in North Vancouver. Um, but uh, she billeted with a family here uh, when she was going to high school. She went to the original PGSS. Yeah. Um, and for a time, apparently, she won't tell me much in the way of details, but she dated a Moffat, uh, yeah. which of course is a very famous family here in, in yeah, town. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then they left, uh, her and her sister left at the outbreak of the Second World War and moved uh, down south to find work and the family stayed there ever since. Yeah, quite a history, uh, Joe. Yeah. You know, yeah. so interesting for you to kind of follow that and obviously, and then now you here and your family is here. So, but what did you, uh, your studies, uh, 
uh, that you had uh, in the Lower Mainland. Uh, yeah, I uh, somewhere around when I turned 12, I uh, I don't know, I had a, a friend, I've always had a lot of imagination. I had a friend come over to the house one day and I was still playing with action figures and he was like, man, he's like, you're 12, like you got to stop playing with action figures, right? And I, I kind of took it personally and I'm like, oh, like, I guess I'm too old for this. And so I started uh, writing. I wanted to be a writer. And um, so I started taking, I got, I put away the toys and, and started uh, what I thought was a more acceptable practice of attempting to try and be a, a fiction writer. Um, and so I did that all through my teens. Um, and I was published uh, with some poetry when I was 17. And that was what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a novelist. And right. uh, I... Um, Started working and uh, decided you can't make money as a novelist, um, but I was passionate about writing. Uh, so after a couple of years of high school and work, I decided to go back and study journalism. So I got a degree at Kwantlen, a four-year degree in print journalism. Okay. And went into the media, uh, and that was kind of um, a, my first major career was in the media. And I covered the natural resource sectors by happenstance. Business in Vancouver. Business in Vancouver. Yeah. And um, nobody else wanted that beat. No. It was the weirdest thing. I got there and my, the editor was like, hey, he's like, I've got a job for you if you want one. Um, and uh, at the time, I was actually competing uh, for a job to join the Navy. And um, me, my editor said, well, hang out here until you go to the Navy. And I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds good. And uh, they're like, we'll give you this beat. It's mining, forestry, oil and gas, uh, agriculture, fisheries. And I'm like, oh, that sounds big. I don't know anything about any of those things. Right. Like, mm, city kid. Uh, and all the other reporters laughed. They're like, nobody wants it. That's why you're getting it. Yeah. Um, but I got about a month into it. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And I get to write about all of these issues that are about the, the entire world. Um, all of these interesting entrepreneurs like yourself, who are out there creating value out of the land base right. and all of the major political issues in Canada, uh, worldwide, all kind of tie to the extractive industries. And so in that, as a writer and as somebody who was looking for an adventure, I found my adventure and I stuck with journalism. And that ultimately is what led to me traveling up north, writing stories about uh, what was going on in, in our in extractive sectors here yeah. um, and falling in love with these towns, this place and the lifestyle and then eventually deciding that I wanted to move up north. Yeah, how long were you with uh, Business in Vancouver? Um, I was there probably all told. I started out as an, as an unpaid intern when that was still a, a thing that companies could get away with. Um, and I was probably there all told about four years on and off, about yeah. three full time. Yeah. And in, it was a short period of time. I was pretty young when I got into, for a business journalist, I was 24 to get into that role and to be handed yeah. that beat. Um, and I was, I became an editor at BIV, uh, within two years. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so at the time I, I was probably, I was certainly the youngest editor of a, of a, a fairly major media publication in, in, um, Vancouver. Right. Um, but probably one of the younger editors in Canada at the time for business media. Who, who, who owns the BIV? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Glacier media. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, and they're a, they're a publicly traded company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, it was interesting because being a, a, a business journalist wasn't why I got into journalism. Like, right. like, I wanted to write stories. I actually originally wanted to be a war correspondent. Like, I wanted yeah. to travel the world and have adventures. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I had a, a professor that said, hey, you should try this business thing. You might be good at it. And so I interned and then I got into right. it. Um, but, you know, being a business journalist, especially for a publication like BIV, was like getting an MBA on the street. Yeah. You know, I got to talk to people like you, you know, yeah. all the time uh, and sit down with CEOs and pick their brains about things and have just incredible access right. to people who've been around for, for a lot of years. And it really gave me a, a true appreciation and a passion for business and, yeah. and economic development. And, and, and you traveled all over BC. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. And gave the exposure to Northern BC as well. Yeah, you know, it's funny, right? Because you start, you know, writing these stories and you get into, you know, forestry and forest policy and you don't know what you're doing. And your job is to cough up stories that um, for an audience that is fairly savvy. And I, within a few months, I really started to appreciate the importance of actually going to the place yeah. and understanding the issues in the place. Yeah. Like you can talk about 
in forestry, lumber prices and softwood trade deals and stumpage and all those things. But until you've been to Prince George, until you've gone through a mill, until you've sat down with someone like you, yeah. listened to the actual experience that's behind it, you don't right. get it. Yeah. And you can't then, if you don't get it, you can't translate to that to your audience, no. right? And so yeah. that was a, an important lesson and it's something that I think I've, I've tried to carry along the way is to yeah. really get out to the place, understand the place before you make judgments about it. Yeah, so then when did you come north? How old were you then? Because you were fairly young at uh, I was. Business yeah. in Vancouver. Yeah, I was 27 at that point in time. Um, and. Uh, what had happened was um, I had I had, had some success. I had, uh, in the time that I was there, my editor and publisher were very supportive of doing more in-depth sort of uh, long features slash investigative features. And I kind of made a bit of a, I don't want to say a name for myself, but I, uh, a niche in doing that in Vancouver. There wasn't right. a lot of people doing that at the time. And I had success with a four-part series I did on uh, the prosperity, the proposed prosperity copper gold mine out near um, Ogacho. Yeah. And um, that led to me getting um, a promotion and then um, some eyes were on me in the media sphere and, and I had people knocking on my door asking me to consider, you know, going to, you know, other media outlets. Yeah. Um, which at the time I thought was great and yeah. I looked at opportunities in Toronto, but um, my personal life changed at that point in time and um, I was traveling up here and I came up to do a series of stories on the Babine Mill and the Lakeland Mill after yeah. the blast in 2012. Yeah. And it was April of 2012 and it had not been my first trip to the north, it was one of, of several. And I uh, was, I got delayed on the highway coming back. And so I, my flight got delayed and I ended up um, going for dinner with a, a friend here at his place. It was a beautiful April evening and people don't describe April as a particularly right. attractive time of year in Prince George. Yeah. Um, but I had a wonderful evening and I ended up at the airport and I was sitting in the airport waiting for my flight. And it was just this warm, perfect sunny evening. And I'm like, uh, no, the future's not in Toronto, it's here. So I went home that night and I emailed um, Janine, who was the CEO prior to me at the yeah. Trust and who I knew quite well. And I said, hey, if you've ever heard of an opportunity in Northern BC, uh, let me know. I'd be interested. And she said, why don't you come work for me? Yeah. And uh, it was done. And so, you know, I owe a lot What year of, was that, uh, That was 2012. Yeah. 2012. So it's been 10 years. It'll be 10 years um, uh, next month in June that yeah. I've, I'm, I've been here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where it all started. Were you already married then or? No, well, that's sort of what changed. So I, um, I am one of the, the many millennials uh, who has not had success with marriage. I have what I, I would describe as a starter marriage. Right. Um, so I had uh, uh, my partner, she and I got married in uh, the fall of 2011 and it fell apart within months. We were actually together for seven years. Right. Um, but I guess getting married was the message we needed that it wasn't going to work. Right. <laughs> And so we split up in early 2012. And when I found myself as, you know, an editor of a media publication living in a loan in an apartment in downtown Vancouver, and I'd kind of gotten to where I wanted to get, and I was starting to look further afield, um, things just changed for me. And suddenly, right. you know, moving to Northern BC and starting a life here um, was an option. I could yeah. do it. I had no other ties. I could yeah. just pick up and go. And if it didn't work yeah. out, well, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so here we are. Yeah. 10 now, years later. 10 years later. Now, how yeah. about you? You came in 65? 65, yeah. So 1965. what was the pathway for you to get here? Because I know, obviously, you come from Europe. Um, Holland. Holland. There yeah. we go. So what was the path that actually led to Prince George and not Edmonton or Toronto or anywhere yeah. else? Good question. Is that, uh, you know, the uh, I was born in 1940 in northeastern North Holland. We were liberated by the Canadian Army and... April the 12th, 1945, and I was five years old, but I remember it clearly, all the things that were going on it was tough go. You know, uh, obviously it was the hunger winter from 1944 to 45. And then when the Canadians liberated us, uh, you know, the, uh, there was a lot of hunger and, uh, you know, and, and issues with, uh, uh, you know, people having a difficult time to keeping their families uh, together and uh, so the uh, so what we would do in the mornings when the first Canadian 
small section of the Canadian Army came in right behind our house. Uh, you know, we would go there every morning and they would feed us bread with butter and cheese and the butter and cheese was bigger than the bread and everybody was called Johnny. It made such an impression on me that I knew from that point forward I would go to Canada. Mm. And uh, so that was step one. That was, that was it. So, so soldiers were effectively re recruiters. In, yeah, in that more way. or less yeah, in yeah. my in, particular in, in case. case yeah. And still Canada has an amazing high uh, respect by all the people in Holland, all the way from all the way small to older because- I've heard that. They were, they were absolutely instrumental in liberating the country and they never forgot it. And uh, so the next thing that happened to me is that uh, my dad was uh, managing a small lumber company and, uh, and uh, I got some experience in that. So, uh, you know, the other dream that I had is build my own lumber mill. Okay. And uh, so then, uh, you know, the, uh, when I was 18, I was drafted into the Canadian Air Force or to the Dutch Air Force mandatory and for two years and then when I came out it was uh, around 2021 and uh, worked again in the lumber industry in Holland and uh, then decided uh, when I was 24 to go to Canada hmm. and started out with uh, left with $150 one suitcase one set of clothes couple of books and I, that's how I was going to start and then where do you go if you want to go into the lumber business British Columbia and so when I came Arrived in British Columbia, I went to the, I couldn't speak the language, didn't know a soul. And, uh, you know, so when I arrived in Vancouver, talked to the immigration, immigration fellow who spoke German and I could speak some German. And I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, print shorts. Hmm. That's where you have to go. Okay. And so that's where I ended up. So it was uh, uh, July of uh, 1965 when I came off the Greyhound bus about three blocks away from here. Yep. I had, as you can see here, in my pocket, I had $25.47 <laughs> <laughs> I counted it many times and, uh, you know, and, and so, uh, and I wanted to build a lumber mill. Did you, after you got here, you know, you, some people they get here, they're here for a couple of years and then they kind of start, you know, they want to leave. Was there ever a point after you got here where you're like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to head somewhere else for a while, or I don't see my future necessarily in Prince George. I could go somewhere else. Or did you know? Oh, you I knew. knew. You knew. Yeah. What was it about the place? Well, that, that what was attractive to me here is that the timber is here and the opportunities to build a lumber mill or get involved in the industry and eventually build my own mill would be here. Okay. And I knew that right from then, you know, so, uh, and that was, uh, you know, 47 years ago, right? So the, uh, and uh, yeah, you know, so yeah, that's what it was. Do you think the community is as welcoming today as it was then? Or is it more welcoming now? How do you think? I believe it did. What has happened, Joel, is that uh, when I arrived here in July of 1965, it was a boom town. Mm. So the normal dialogue would be, when did you get here? And when are you leaving? And so it evolved from there into, a community, uh, and we are, know it so well, uh, looking at the uh, colleges, uh, the College of New Caledonia, U University of Northern British Columbia, look behind us, uh, a, a major swimming pool being developed. This has become a family town, an ideal environment to bring a family and to grow up and then for the young people that, that, that are pursuing a career, there is no better place than Northern British Columbia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and as you did when you came here and you looked around and you got that light bulb moment at the airport and saying, yeah, this, I think this is where the opportunities yeah. are. You know, what's funny is I, when I had that moment and then I got the job and I accepted the job, I slowly started to tell some of my friends and family in Vancouver, yeah. Everybody said I was nuts. Yeah. Why are you going to Prince George? Prince George is like, you know, it's the worst place in British Columbia. It's got a terrible reputation. Do you know about the crime there? Yeah. Like you're leaving a great job. You live downtown. What are you doing? Yeah. And I just remember like I almost had to get like, um, 
not m mean or cruel about it, but I, I just had to, without explanation, just say to people, no, like this is, I'm, I'm certain of this. This yeah. is the place to go. This is where my future is going to be. You see the other part about it, Joe, because you were involved in the financial things as well. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, with the trust uh, uh, entity that you work with, obviously, is that, uh, you know, that uh, what I say to my friends south, you know, Prince George is the capital of Northern British Columbia, and that 75 to 80 percent of the GDP uh, uh, the, the, is generated in Northern BC. And I always kind of remind my fellows down south and saying, here's, the, here's where the money comes from. Yeah. And the, the potential in terms of growth is amazing. And the same applies to uh, Prince George, but the region in a general way. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think. I still think after 10 years that it's only a matter of time till the rest of humanity figures out how attractive Northern British Columbia is just as a place to live. Oh yeah. And as soon as the world figures out about this, um, you're going to have a bunch of people that are going to want to call this place home, right? And yeah. there's a, a part of me that really looks forward to that as a person who did that. There's also a part of me who's been here 10 years now and likes it kind of the way it is. And yeah. so I, I think like many people, I struggle now as I, I would describe myself as a northerner. Yeah. Um, but I do struggle at times with, I, you know, my job is to try and incent development and support development and, and the improvement of the region. But I also don't want it to lose what makes it so special. Yeah. And, and, and that's very much so, you know, but at the same time, you know, Rag, uh, for myself and I've always been very involved in the community and uh, in building the community and uh, it gave me, gives me a unique perspective because I was here when it was a boom town, mm -hmm. no question about it. I've seen the evolution, can you imagine in a lifetime to see that, uh, you know, coming from the European side where things have been going on for hundreds of years, here it evolved virtually all in one lifetime. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, company, the, the city was incorporated in 1914 and, uh, you know, less than a hundred years, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, so it's unique and it's still expanding and growing. And uh, examples of that are the College of New Caledonia and the University of Northern British Columbia. Yeah. And it's still expanding beyond that. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about is that, uh, Tell me a little bit more about the, uh, and I have to look at the name again, uh, the Northern Development Initiative Trust. Uh, tell us what it is. What it is, yeah. Uh, well, I can help you right away. The, the easiest way to refer to us is either Northern Development or the Trust. Yeah. There's only one of them in Northern BC, yeah. so you can get away with we'll that. We'll call it the Trust. Yeah, just call it the Trust. So the yeah. Trust, uh, the Trust is unique. It's uh, particularly unique in, in Canada. It's even unique in British Columbia, although there are other trusts. Uh, we are, uh, to get the jargon somewhat correct, we're an arm's length uh, public sector entity that is here to use its money to develop the economy. Right. What we actually do is we make money, we give money away, and we give money away to things that create jobs and make communities more economically sustainable. Right. So we like to joke at the office sometimes we're a bit like the public sector version of Santa Claus or the money fairies, right? Right. Uh, if we're doing our job correctly, there is money that continues to be produced from the trust that benefits the region. The history of the trust is, you, you probably recall with, with uh, a, a great memory, the sale of BC Rail. Yeah. Out of the a billion dollars. That's right. Uh, not every community was super happy about that. No. Um, the premier of the day knew that. Um, and one of the ways that government responded back in 2003 was to announce this idea of the Northern Development Initiative Trust. Right. Which they would take a part of the proceeds of that sale uh, and create this entity that would be run by Northerners. Government in Victoria would not make decisions around it. Right. Um, and they would go out and spend the money on whatever they wanted as long as it fell within that ma mandate of the, e right. the economy. And what's interesting about that is it, it is actually, the trust is actually the only thing Northern British Columbia truly owns. Yeah. Northern British Columbia does not own the university. It right. does not own the college. It does not right. own the, the hospital. Right. All of those decisions are ultimately can be traced back. The money that comes out of them to Victoria and to some extent Ottawa as That's well. That's where the funding comes from. 
The trust is unique. Our yeah. money is our money. We've managed it since 2005, and our board of directors is made up of mayors uh, yeah. and people who live in northern BC. Um, and so it is the one thing that the region truly gets a say in and gets to control. Um, we are a sustainable trust. So when we started, we were infused with 185 million. Um, there was no rules around how that 185 should be used other than that it should be for economic development. The board and our regional advisors of the day very wisely chose that it should be a sustainable trust. Right. Um, there was meaning. meaning that we invest that 185 with an investment manager and the returns on that, the proceeds that we get off of that are what support all of our grant programs. Right. That was not a, there was not a 100% agreement that that should be the case. Right. And it took us about 10 years before I finally started to see that nobody brought that up in conversations anymore, where the trust had been around long enough that it had proved itself. Right. So that initial board and management team you know, took that money, had an investment manager, uh, started generating proceeds in the market, and then the proceeds supported grant programs. Right. And you know, today in a town like Prince George, but pretty much uh, every town in Northern BC, and I'll add as a, a color commentary note here, Northern BC is defined in our legislation extends to Lytton. Yeah. So, which no one in the North would describe as Northern British Columbia, but, no. but if you live in Victoria, you probably think is Northern British Columbia. Right. So we serve an area the size of France, um, and it only has 330,000 people in it. Um, but if you get back and you say, well, what's the impact of the trust? Well, there is not a, a public building in Prince George that the trust has not had a hand in, in terms of improving or getting off the ground. Right. The Northern Sports Center at UNBC, the expansion of, of the airport, the Kin Center, um, the CN Center's had upgrades, the Aquatic Center has upgraded, the Elk Center's had upgrades, the tennis courts, the Golf and Country Club, um, the Marriott Hotel downtown in Prince George, the Wood Innovation Design Center, this building we are sitting right now is, I will not say and I will not claim that any of these things are entirely the result of the trust. We're just one part of it. Right. But our money helped to incentivize the development of this building, which is part of, of a revitalization initiative in the downtown, which is ongoing. Yeah. And so we are quiet we don't make a point of going out and, and saying, look how great we are. Right. Our view on the world is that our job is to manage that money, make sure that the way we're delivering it is directed by the communities we serve, and then we celebrate the communities with the successes that they build with that money. Is it growing? Yes, yeah, yeah it is. So it started at 185. Um, when I took over, it, was, it had grown to about 260. Yeah. Um, and today we're over 500 million. Yeah. Um, it, the business has changed in the last uh, five years, six years that I've been at the helm. Half of that is more than half of that is our money. About 300 and some odd million of it is that core money that we've we've grown. The other part of it is money that we deliver on behalf of government uh, for programs that support Northern BC. Right. One of the things that we've been able to prove is that. Um, because the way that we do business, because there's local decision making involved, um, we are really administrative efficiently efficient and the communities are really like what we do. So government started coming to us years ago, long before I took over and said, hey, would you deliver this money in this program? Right. And so in the last five or six years, that's really grown and it's gone uh, when I assumed the role of CEO, we were managing about 10 million in what we call third party funds. And today it's about 240, 250 million. Yeah. So we've been able to grow that side of the business significantly and create an organization that, you know, is influencing the North in many ways that we were not influencing it before. So what does you make you different from a bank? So because we got people watching here and saying, oh my God, they, they have money to lend, uh, you know, maybe very, very good rates. Uh, yeah, you know. we're, we occupy the space, so we don't want to compete with the banks and the credit unions. Uh, we also don't want to speak, uh, compete with the community futures. Each entity has its own role. So we're a grant funder. Right. Uh, so we will occasionally do loans, but our, our, our loan book value is less than 10 million at this point in time. Right. And, and we really don't do loans anymore. It's not a business that we want to be in. And part of the reason why is that when you're a public sector entity and they find out that you do lending, you tend to be viewed as the lender of last resort. By the yeah. time somebody walks through my door, 
they've already been turned down by most of the banks. And yeah. so the business case for me to get involved or for the trust to get involved just isn't there. So primarily what we're doing, you know, I would say 99.9% .9 of the dollars out the door these days are grants. So, so what does that mean, Joel? So grant funders, what does that mean? Yeah, so um, who can access the money is kind of the answer to that question. So if you are a local government, an indigenous government, a nonprofit, or a business, um, you may be eligible to apply for a grant from the trust. A right. grant is, for those who don't live in our world, it means you fill out an application, you make the rationale, if you're approved for the money, you get the money. Then all you have to do is carry out the project. There's no payback on that. It's not okay. repayable. There's no, no terms. There's no interest it's on free. it. It's free. Yeah. Why do we do that? We do that because the trust, the idea behind the trust was that although the Northern BC economy is a huge con outsized contributor to the economy in British Columbia, the economy, the market is still failing in some areas right. where we're not seeing even development in communities across yeah. the region. And so it needs intervention. That intervention, part of that intervention is our money. And so what does that translate into? Well, a lot of the community development we do and the things that I mentioned before, what are we trying to achieve there? Well, we're trying to achieve with our money to create a community that is more attractive to live in. Right. Because the workforce of today is highly mobile. They right. want to be in a community. They have choice of where they work. Right. Uh, choice of where they live. And so if Northern BC is going to attract people to fill all those jobs we have, we need to have attractive communities with amenities and services. And so our entire community development aspect of our business, which is a big part of our bread and butter, is around that. The grants we do for businesses um, are small and medium enterprise. A lot of them would be like a, a logging company, um, a smaller company than yours necessarily, but maybe one that you hire to help you carry out your work. Right. Let's say you've got a company, it's a logging company, in order to work for Brink Forest, they need to get a core safety certification or they need to get a, their financial system in, in order so they can track their spending. Otherwise, you're not gonna hire them to do right. some work for you. Well, that costs them money. They gotta hire a consultant. Right. Well, Northern Development will actually help carry the cost of that consultant because right. we believe that if we can put some money into small businesses, we can help Northern BC businesses grow right. and create jobs. We're creating more economic diversity and sustainability and money in the system, right? right? So we're, we're not focused so much on injecting money into large publicly traded companies our money isn't enough to make a difference there anyway. No. Um, but on the small and medium enterprise side, if we can continue to put in thirty and fifty thousand dollar grants, support innovation across businesses in the north, we feel that you know if you're creating five jobs here and ten jobs there and twenty jobs there, and if you do that enough, you're creating a lot of resilience, a lot of innovation. And in the that economy. means northern BC or how far north? We go all the way up to uh, the Yukon border. Right. Yeah. And south? Uh, all the way to Lytton. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's a big area to surf. A lot of lot of diversity in that, and a lot yeah. of different priorities too. Yeah. And so you know, when you bring that up, it's an interesting point because how we support economic development on Haida Gwaii yeah. is very different than how we support economic exactly. development in Fort St. John or in Prince George. Yeah. And so that's where the governance model of the trust really comes in handy because our regional advisors and our board, well, they're people from those areas. Yeah, yeah. And they can give me advice and our team advice on how to design programs that are going to support economic development yeah. on Haida Gwaii and Fort St. Yeah. John and Prince George. And then there's a fair amount of competition between the different communities as well I yeah presume. yeah yeah and you know like we we try to get the communities in this day and age to not compete with one another right right like it, my view of that is look like if if Fort St. James or Vanderhoof gets you know the next McDonald's or Tim's or Mill or investment you know, the, the next community over shouldn't be jealous and get mad about it. We right. need to celebrate each other's success. Yeah. You know, we need to be the, more than the sum of our parts in the North because as you know, in the North, we're already starting from behind here. Exactly. Right? Like we're yeah. behind the eight ball as a region. Most yeah. people don't pay attention to us. We don't have a lot of political capital, especially no. these days. Uh, and we're under resourced or under capacity. And so, and we're far from a lot of the major markets. Yeah. So, you know, that competition, competition is good. I'm a big believer in competition in the market, but from a public sector perspective, I think our communities need to work together. They need to collaborate. They yeah. need to they need to lever each other's strengths if we're ever going to 
help the region move beyond you know the the staples trap that exactly. we have largely been stuck in for the last yeah. half century yeah so that's the trust and uh, and that's still expanding i presume as you already these numbers that you're talking about are very very impressive yeah yeah it is i mean you know there's We've grown a lot, and my challenge as CEO in the last five or six years has been a, a happy challenge, but an interesting challenge around how to scale a business to that level of growth. Yeah. So, you know, when I took over, I didn't think I would have that level of growth. I thought I was inheriting a very well run organization with a very good reputation, and the books were in order. Um, but I, I thought it would be hey, this is my first gig as a CEO, I'll be able to learn the ropes, and then, you know, the challenge will be in the next gig as a CEO somewhere else. Um, but it, almost from the get-go, there was this opportunity to grow the business, and I'm not the type that would turn away from that. I'm, right. I'm a person that runs it challenge, so I, uh, I embraced it, uh, and we doubled our size, and then I had to learn on the fly not only how to be a, a CEO, a young CEO in a northern town, uh, but also how to scale to that growth yeah. and how to do it responsibly because this isn't my own company. This is the public sector yeah. and everybody's watching. Yeah. And, and uh, the likelihood is that it will grow from here on forward uh, at, at a similar pay, pace is highly likely. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's ultimately the board's decision. I mean, we still have opportunities. We have to make sure that we're managing our investment portfolio responsibly um, to, so that that continue to grow. And, you know, the inflationary environment that we're in right now kind of creates a bit of a, you know, a, a, a challenge around that. Um, but I think we've got that well in order. And, and then what happens on the other side in terms of delivery of funds for other entities, there's a lot of opportunity to grow there, but it is contingent upon having a good reputation and a lot of strong um, relationships with um, the provincial government and the federal government. Yeah. And so, you know, so much of this hinges on the notion that, you know, I don't know that government knew this when they created us and they put trust in our name. They thought trust because it has money. It'll be operate like a trust. But the truth of it is after 16 years, its success is built on the other meaning of that word, which is everybody has to trust us. Yeah. The public, the mayors, the chiefs, yeah, exactly. business and government. And so my goal at this point is, you know, eventually I'll be done in this role. I'll move on right. and do something else. Um, I need to be able to get it to a place like my predecessor did where I can hand it off to that, that next generation of leadership yeah. and they can take it to new heights and do things that I never conceived of or didn't have the yeah. capacity to do. And that truly will be, um, if that happens, then I will know after the fact that I have been successful in my role. Yeah, no, for sure. Now, now the other thing, you're quite involved in other areas as well, other than the trust. Uh, you are involved in UNBC. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. You are on the board. Yeah, so um, the Minister of Advanced Education appointed me to the Board of Governors about a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, and it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, a graduate of UNBC. I went to Kwantlen. My wife is a graduate of UNBC. She's very passionate about it. Um, I think we're all collectively passionate about UNBC uh, here in Prince George um, and you know the opportunity to give back to an organization on a volunteer basis and learn more about advanced education and how we could carry the torch forward similar to the trust but in the case of, of the university of this idea that the north needs its own university it needs right. to have education institutions up here and how do we reaffirm that idea for the next generation that it is important that we educate northerners in the north because they are more likely to stay in the north than somebody coming from the south yeah and so that's really what um interested me in it. and it's an exciting time at the university we've got a new president yeah. um you know the university is 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 in good shape and uh, it has a lot of exciting things uh, going for it so for me as a as a, a board director, I'm not the right person to speak on behalf of the, the university, except to say I've really enjoyed my year and a half up there, and I hope I'll have you know a few more years to try and support that institution in the direction it needs to go. Yeah, and the, uh, UNBC started really as a concept and as an idea in the early 80s, and uh, more and more the conversation would go around having a university in Northern British Columbia. 
And as you know, uh, you know, the uh, universities and colleges are funded by the provincial government substantially. And, uh, you know, which is a challenge mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, but uh, so the history behind how it all occurred. Uh, I was a an, an writing president at the time of uh, Prince George North and very involved politically to convince the politicians that they should be funding not just the university or subsidiary of UBC, yeah. but a freestanding university uh, was the objective. And, uh, you know, in, uh, in, I always remember 1987 when, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, we had several busloads of uh, one to Penticton, where was the, uh, the Socrates were in power then. And, uh, you know, and we flooded the AGM with signs of a Northern University and, and buttons and all the other things. And then, uh, you know, finally in 1989, uh, government, uh, the BC government approved funding of the University of Northern British Columbia. And, uh, you know, which now obviously is one of the freestanding universities and it will, it has already changed the North. Uh, you know, it's not just the, the region is Northern BC and uh, it will grow substantially from here on forward. Yeah. And, and the same applies to the college. Yep. And one of the other things that we are working on now is to, uh, especially with the, uh, how do we attract more manufacturing? Uh, you know, and, and, and our, uh, the, 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 the products that we harvest are the, uh, you know, here, uh, may they be in mining, may they be in lumber, and, and put it into finished products yep. or new products for new markets and uh, has always been the objective. The opportunities here are so immense. We have the resources, we have the location, we have the transportation system, air, rail, road, and location, and uh, we have, uh, we are attractive to uh, uh, the financial side in terms of from an investment perspective and uh, to attract entrepreneurship. The one area that is a critical area is how do we, how do we develop the skill sets that we require to attract those people that will invest, and that still is a, a critical area that uh, you know that we have to deal with and we have been working on between U UNBC uh, and the College of New Caledonia in particular on developing uh, uh, a center of excellence mm -hmm. that looks somewhat like BCIT mm -hmm. uh, not to the same size obviously but it fills that niche and and that creates uh, n new ideas in regards to uh, manufacturing equipment, uh, you know, the uh, uh, technology that uh, in particular, because all the, the skill sets will look different five, ten years from now than they are today, uh, you know, that deal with all those issues. Yeah. And that is the next big challenge. I, I think you're bang on with the, the manufacturing and the value add piece. Um, that is the direction we need to get it, to go, and you can see that in the migration of the global economy. That that is where the next step is, and yeah. we have real opportunity with that. I think you're also right with the skill set, and I, I'd add something else that I think is really important. It's something that you have, and other entrepreneurs in the region have, which is um, the vision, vision and understanding of of the north and what it needs. Um, right. And you know, the, the, the folks that live in Victoria and Vancouver and Ottawa are very good because they will be the first to admit that they don't know what the answer is for right. Northern BC and that Northern BC needs to chart its own course. But this comes back to the notion of why we need to, from a leadership perspective in the North, not compete with one another, but actually work together and select a few exactly. priorities and advance them. Have a vision like yeah. they did in yeah. 1987 yeah. for the university and not be quiet about it exactly. and work together to advance that. We can't solve 
northern BC's problems by whining. No. We can't solve them by waiting for Victoria or Ottawa to come up with the answer no. or show up with, you know, a, a pot of money. Yeah. We need to figure these things out for ourselves. We need to do it together. Yeah. And we need to advance those ideas. Yeah. And we have the responsibility and the obligation, I think, to do that. Yeah. Um, because previous generations have. Yeah. And if we're forecasting out you know, what the previous generations did to help us get here and enjoy the life that we have in Prince George and other communities, we need to be thinking about the future generation. I need to sure. think about my daughters yeah. um, and their kids and what my role is in yeah. this to leave the North better than I found it. Yeah, um, and, and the interesting part about it, Joel, is that uh, we look at UNBC, we look at CNC and, and all the satellites they have throughout all of northern uh, BC uh, the, the all the communities that are directly linked and then uh, some something interesting a uh, number of months ago uh, in our boardroom we were sitting around the table uh, you know with about four five six seven eight people every single one was an alumni of UNBC including me I got an honorary doctorate right. uh, you know so uh, and, and that's the reason why uh, we have to go beyond where we are now. UNB UNBC has served as well and is still serving as well and is still expanding. Yep. So is CNC. We also have to get the center of excellence that kind of lifts us up with all the resources that we have, the location, transportation system. We need to become the best at what we can be in terms of creating new products for new markets from the resources that we have here. Yeah. And we can do it, you know, yeah. so uh, yeah, and we have done it in the past. We will do it in the future. Yeah. You know, I've, I, I, I've always been challenged with this um, binary um, proposal that is often floated in, in media and in popular conversation of uh, it's either, you know, resources or the environment. I completely disagree with that yeah, uh, that too. proposition, and I've I've said to a lot of people for years, you know, Northern British Columbia, British Columbia at, at large, but especially Northern British Columbia, it is right at the crux of all of the issues that the world is trying to sort out right now. Exactly, climate change, reconciliation with a colonial past, yeah. extractive industries. Northern BC yeah. has a really challenging geography, yeah. really challenging climate conditions. Yeah. It's got water everywhere, yeah. and so and it has a wealth of resources both in terms of timber oil gas copper gold molly anything you can exactly. name here yeah. and so i have thought well we also have a university we also have a college and we've got this thing called a trust that has money that yeah. has a mandate for it and we've got entrepreneurial yeah. leadership and vision here why isn't northern british columbia positioning itself as the world leader on how to develop resources responsibly yeah. with little to no environmental impact that respects and reconciles what that relationship is and the decision making coming from indigenous communities. And we can do it. We can both. do it. We can do it all it's here. It's not one or the other, it's both. It's both. And, and if we did that here, yeah. then I think we have another industry that comes out of that, which yeah. is that the knowledge and expertise on how to do that can yeah. then be exported and sold as a service exactly. to every other part of the world that hasn't figured that out exactly. yet. Exactly. And be the example where people will come from war, far and wide to see what we're doing, how we're doing it, and uh, you know, because uh, that's what it would be, yep. and and I believe we can do that. Yeah. Now, that then being said, you're still a young man, and so uh, what's your future going forward? But, but uh, <laughs> how do you do? You have you married? You have two daughters. How old yep. are your daughters? Uh, seven and five. And what's the names? Rose and Ava. Okay. Um, my future is, is, is... How about your wife? Talk, talk about your wife a little uh, bit. She is um, uh, a far better human than I am. Uh, okay. I'm lucky to have her. Um, she is... Uh, Good name. Uh, Deborah. She's born and raised in Quinnell um, okay. in, in Barlow Creek and uh, attended UNBC in the 90s for poli sci and then went to law school at UVic. Oh. And she's a, a crown prosecutor here in town. 
Oh. Um, so she has an incredibly challenging uh, job that uh, provides a lot of value uh, to our community and to the north. Yeah. Um, and uh, is uh, more than anything an amazing partner and just an incredible mother. Uh, right. You know, I'm, I'm lucky to be one of those people that looks as a partner that I look at every day and say, you're actually a better human being than I am. And, yeah. and I need to, you know, learn from that. Yeah. Amazing, really, right? So the, uh, so you see your future pretty much in northern BC, and then yeah. in BC because, uh, as you already said, your your roots are here in the Robson Valley, in fact, uh, substantially, and uh, uh, yeah. So the uh, interesting future, looking forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I don't want to leave. So yeah. I will try and find whatever opportunity it can be after, you know, I move on from the trust to stay in the region. And who knows? I mean, my wife has made sacrifices in her career, so it might be her turn to, yeah. uh, as a family, put her career in the forefront and I can uh, be home and maybe try and deliver on that still existing dream to be a trashy novelist, which is still there. Um, but we'll see what the future holds. I never thought I'd be here. No. So I, I also live every day thinking, you know what, I'm just going to get along with people. I'm going to do the best work that I can, try to be a decent human being. And whatever opportunity comes my way, I will seek it out or not. Now, you're also an author. You wrote a book. Yeah. It's tell, not, us, tell us about that. It's not published yet. So no. I... Um, I have got a, well, I've, yeah. So I did publish a book or we published a book that I, I helped create a few years ago that won a national award, but it's, it's nonfiction. It, uh, out of the trust, we created something about six years ago called the small town PR playbook. Okay. Um, and it was when I was still in a public relations role and, and I was doing that work for small towns and we created a book. Um, that was all about how to do PR effectively in small towns, indigenous communities, because so many of the consultants that do this kind of work come from the big city and they don't get it. Yeah. So we created that book and we got it out there. We thought it would be useful for communities just in Northern BC and it took off nationally. Uh, I had people from Ontario and Quebec and the Maritimes coming to me and saying, where can I get a copy of the book? Or I love the book. I use the book all the time. It went on to win a national award. So that was my first foray in creating a book. Um, and it's still available on the Trust website. On the fiction side, when COVID hit, it, it created an opportunity for me where I was sort of locked down like everybody else. And I was looking for a creative outlet. And so I really started getting back into writing fiction. Um, and I wrote a number of short stories, one of which was published in an anthology last year. It's kind of a fishing story based in wells and supernatural. Um, and um, then this past uh, November, I took on the national novel writing um, challenge, which is you write a whole novel in one month. Right. Um, I, I achieved the challenge, the 50,000 words in a month, um, and then, uh, but it wasn't quite done. Uh, so it took me till about mid-February of this year to finish it. I won't claim it's any good, um, but the first draft is done. I've got to go back and start um, revising it now, and hopefully I'll get it published. It's fantasy. So I, what we haven't talked about fiction. is... Fiction. Yeah, fiction, high mm -hmm. fantasy, like sword and sorcery, dragons and wizards kind of stuff. I'm a super nerd. I haven't told you that, um, but like you get me talking about Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, anything fantasy, science fiction, or horror related, and I'm that's my happy place yeah. as a person. So that's what I tend to write when I'm not, you know, managing public money yeah. or or trying to figure out how to support the economy up here. So the book will come out when? Who knows? I've got a. I mean, who knows if it ever will? I'm going to try. I've got a. I'm going to take probably about a year to revise it, and then I've got to start trying to query publishers and agents and see if I can find somebody to pick it up. So now I wrote a book. Did you did you get a copy of it? I do not have a copy of it, but I so did know that you wrote a book. I'm going to give you a copy of it and it's here somewhere. Let me reach out. I hope you're going to sign it too. Hmm? I hope you're going to sign it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to do that right now. So this one is against all odds. And it's an autobiography, and uh, took me eight years to live it, uh, uh, twenty years to think about it, and two years to write it. Yeah. So it's the first book, uh, quite well done, actually. Uh, I must say myself. At uh, Did you enjoy the writing process? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. You know, but but more complicated than I had visualized. <laughs> you know, so I worked on it for many many years, 
and uh, you know so uh, and then I knew what I had to do is involve some other people that specialize in the field you know, yep. to get it to publication and all the other things right and uh, you know the like if if you look at a book I'm not you probably know that and uh, you know like this is that you know the uh, a book like this, you know, there's the title, and then, uh, you know, what what should the the cover look like? What should the I I signed it to Joe, all the best. Thank you. And, and what what should be the the the, the layout of the yeah, book? Should the there be pictures the in font, it? Should there not be yeah, pictures in it? Yeah. Should there be endorsements in it? And then how does it all kind of fit together? How about the paper? What type of paper? What type of uh, what does it look like in the binding and uh, you know so on and on and on and very very complicated and uh, but uh, so uh, so we got it done uh, about a year ago and and uh, it's out there now it's done quite well as I said and then I had this other thing that uh, I felt very strongly about uh, and you will read about it in the book is uh, uh, the, the book that will come out on July the 8th is ADHD mm. Unlocked. That's the title. It will come out July the eighth, and it's a different approach. ADHD, attention deficit disorder, is that uh, I'm a classic example mm -hmm. of it, and and it has been something that gradually have come to the surface more and more, but there's still stigma attached to it. Yeah. Still not well understood, and uh, you know. So uh, I wrote a book about it, and then. The other thing that I did in the book made it uniquely aimed at ADHD for people that are in 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 some form in, involved in it, either because of family or friends or or people that they work with, or wanting to know more about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I call it the superpower. Well, uh, uh, you're the first person I've heard say that. I was diagnosed with ADHD in the early '90s. And that was kind of the end of it. I got the diagnosis and they're like, oh, you know, maybe we'll give you some Ritalin. And I, they, my parents tried that for about three months and figured out that it didn't work for me. And so we just kind of carried on. But yeah, me, like a lot of other people, were, were people that were given that diagnosis. I, to be honest with you, John, like I have no idea whether that diagnosis in my case is true how it's impacted me, how it's made me different than anybody else. So the interesting, and for our guests watching this, you know, I had absolutely no idea that he would say that. <laughs> and because just before the interview, I was a little bit late coming in because I was talking to my daughter, Tina. I have two daughters too, mm -hmm. uh, Nicole and uh, Tina. And I was talking to uh, Tina and, uh, you know, so she said, uh, I have this thing that I want to talk to you about, but I haven't had much time. I've been busy, busy. And, and so... I said, okay, well, talk to me, uh, you know, tell me now, you know, what, what's going on? So she said, well, uh, you know, we, we have these friends and the friends have a daughter, same age as Hood, my granddaughter mm -hmm. is uh, 11, Eva, and uh, a friend of another friend, she was just diagnosed with ADHD mm -hmm. and they were struggling with it and she said can you talk to them about that and uh, and give them a copy of the book I said can you believe that you know so this is all in one day this happens more and more and more it does and uh, you know on uh, you know we're similar but but different my uh, eldest daughter has autism yeah. And um, my nephew and my stepdad do as well. Um, and we as a family have been, you know, becoming uh, sort of experts by association of, in that over the last few years. And, you know, when it comes back to what you're talking about is your book coming out about ADHD, but also the great work that's happened in this community with the Autism Centre um, and, and the development, how the community has rallied around that. That stuff's really important for Northern British Columbia because, you know, we don't often get 
the resources or necessarily the leadership around some of these things. And they're just as prevalent in our communities as they are down and, south. And we have been very, very, very involved in that with yeah. Jamie and, uh, you know, and, and uh, yeah. her family. So and, it's, and, yeah. it's important that we have people in the community that talk about these things, yeah. that find ways to support them, find yeah. ways to advance it and help each other out. Because again, from that Northerner's perspective, like I don't want to say we're on our own, but we do have to chart our own future here. Yeah. And we can't wait for somebody else to show up uh, with no. the answer. We've got a we've got to rally together and, and yeah. work through some of these things. So, so, so the the book is uh, you know the uh, but by the time that I knew it, uh, you know, I was fifty seven years old when I found a book in a bookstore and uh, driven to distraction, and I said, <laughs> now I finally know who I am. You know, <laughs> yeah. and and then. And then I was ashamed of it, uh, you know, and uh, I was not very good in school. Mm. You know, I was a disaster. No, I wasn't either. I Do failed you... grade three and I <laughs> failed grade seven three times. I failed multiple courses. And in fact, the only reason I graduated high school was because I took the young drivers program that gave me the two credits I needed to get my, my high school diploma. My grades were like atrocious. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so mine is the same. And, and so, but then I said, we have to talk about it more. And because the, the frequency of occurrence of autism and ADHD is far underestimated and it has to come out more in the open. So the book will come out, it's already complete. We are now in the process of, uh, it's getting to print ready, uh, I think in three weeks, I believe. And uh, then it will be ready on the July the 8th and available here in Prince George on the 15th. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, the, and, and the interesting part about the book is it involves another 10 or 12 people that are also ADHD and talk about their experiences mm. and all. And that includes, uh, you know, one of the best known physicians in Prince George. Mm the highest rated one that is not only a medical doctor, but she is also an emergency surgeon and, uh, but also ADHD. Hmm. And, uh, you know, the, uh, and her name is Dr. Tracy Lotz. Well, maybe it is a superpower. It is, it <laughs> is. And that's what I'm saying. That's I'm what like, I've been saying to my daughter about autism. I think that's a superpower too. And, and, you know, share the book, and, uh, and, and, and I find it extremely important to talk about it more. And when I really started talking about it more is that uh, when I got the honor of uh, getting the honorary uh, doctors from uh, UNBC, uh, I did a presentation then that included some of these things that, mm. uh, including ADHD, uh, the inner child and, uh, you know, PTSD resulting from yeah. experience in World War II, you yeah. know, so. Joel, it was my pleasure. I'm going to give you a copy of the book. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you. And, it was uh, a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks again. Yeah, thank yeah. you.